Hey everyone, it's Newt Warren. I'm the Vahinian Gallery Director with AS Productions, and welcome to our next Q&A with Austin Herman, who is the sole creator of the Beyond a Rising Sun exhibition available right now on the ASP View Gallery website. Welcome, Austin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um yeah like i said we just have a few questions so let's get right into it um first of all could you introduce yourself to us by describing your background in the arts in general yeah um so i i graduated from western in 2018 from the bfa studio program um and had previously gotten just my regular studio degree um through as well western um the year before in 2017 originally was really interested in painting process oriented artists was really my interest um, coming into western and it was kind of my end goal until really being able to connect with the staff in a in a way that i wasn't expecting um, and kind of evolving my own personal style um, both in and out of the academic setting and kind of really found printmaking uh, the process of it to just be extremely interesting uh, process-based artists and my own work involving a lot of process um, for painting, whether you know leaving things outside and kind of using environmental telltale things to kind of inform those next steps. Um, printmaking kind of had all those things wrapped up into one and just had so much more I felt you could kind of do with it in a way that maybe painting was feeling limited to and has just been since, yeah, like 2015, 16, just really stuck um, enjoying and loving printmaking. Awesome. Yeah, that's um, something that I've always wanted to try, um, but I didn't take the studio route, so I don't have access to those resources. But um, I can imagine um, that the process of creating the prints um, has got to feel really good for your mental health. Is that the case with you? Um, yeah, definitely not being able to create in a studio setting has definitely been a drawback um, and, and somewhat of the mental struggle um, after academia and, and of course just not maybe having a cohort and some of those people that you kind of get to surround yourself with. Um, but it is, there is like a rhythmic, um, like, yeah, just a rhythmic process. You, you kind of have those steps in place. You kind of get to follow these rules in the sense of like what things need to be done, whether you're soaking the paper or processing a copper plate, um, prepping a screen. And there's a lot of kind of these down times where you're like waiting and you kind of do get to be a little meditative, especially up at Western, the studios for the most part face like, you know, the kind of uh, really beautiful like arboretum and, and some of those natural settings. And whether you're listening to a music or an informative podcast or something, you kind of do get to ruminate and you kind of are waiting for 10 minutes for that plate to etch or 20 minutes for that paper to soak before you can print and even just something as like rolling the brayers and you have these like textural things as well um, for like sensory um, parts to like the process of printing that are very kind of in a way like meditative or some of those natural things that you might do finding yourself if you do have like anxiety and, and whatnot like oh, like, isn't this interesting? I'm running through these like sensory things, whether it's like the clean air or the trees moving or or something and, and noticing things. And parts of that printmaking process definitely holds some of those uh, things that maybe I didn't realize as much until after I left. Um, but maybe those as well were things that really drew me in um, and helped me both find like the enrichment from the uh, printmaking process, but also like were helping me in ways that maybe I didn't realize. Cool. Yeah. Um, I I think that for me, if I if I did have the opportunity to do um, printmaking, I think I would enjoy that the process is um, formulaic and that you know um, which steps are coming next. Um, whereas I feel like I the thing that I used to do the most was oil painting, and I didn't I had full control over the over the choices that I had. Um, with painting, whereas like, I feel like with printmaking, there are certain steps that you have to take in a certain order to get the desired result. And I didn't like having that control over um, painting. So I think personally, I would enjoy it. Um, do you, 
is printmaking something that you always knew that you would be interested in or is it something that you found through your experience at Western? It was definitely something found through the experience at Western. Um, especially the time that I came into Western was really interesting. Um, the current uh, faculty head of the printmaking department, Lisa Turner, had just kind of been getting in there after the last printmaking professor had like left. And I think they went through like a little bit of a lapse. Um, and they were really focused on like maybe one type of printmaking, um, like specific for like copper etching and lino or like relief um, carving. And I don't think they really were branching out maybe in the ways that Lisa tried to maybe bring a lot of things full circle or to use the devices that they had up there, different presses, um, unused like litho stones and whatnot, and really be able to expand the printmaking one. Um, I believe that year two, my first year, there was literally only like five classes that were available for a lot of the art majors. So you're around a lot of the same people, but it was like, you only had painting, you only had drawing, only sculpture um, with like the late Sebastian. And um, yeah, I forget, maybe there was one kind of like, like crafting sort of like sculptural, like process oriented, like kind of like concept development one. Um, and it was very limiting. And it was kind of one of those things where when you were looking where to go, like there wasn't really a photography department. Um, Garth and Pierre, I think were both on like sabbatical that year. Um, so you knew if you tried to start that, you weren't really going to be getting your, your full spectrum of like some of those professors or the classes weren't even available to like finalize a specific focus. Um, and it, it kind of drew me into taking some fabric classes with Seiko um, and an adjunct uh, professor Margot. Um, and I really enjoyed having both of their um, kind of like different, um, you know, backgrounds of education and, and Seiko with a lot of like traditional Japanese textile printing and uh, fabric dyeing, and then Margot themselves as well as like just a very um, educated and versatile printmaker themselves. And it was kind of the first like steps to seeing like, okay, like Cynthia isn't having classes um, for painting and, and not having some of those professors really there kind of like pushed me maybe to like explore what I was doing and as well Sebastian really kind of helped push the barrier for like thinking outside the box um, and that same year I had actually broken my clavicle and was having issues doing like certain classes in general um, and so it kind of pushed to like do some of these simpler ones while I was like kind of rehabilitating myself and some of the slower parts of like printmaking and letting things kind of die and not necessarily having to move canvases around and, and do some of the like stretching of, of uh, canvases as well kind of like all culminated together into kind of like finding that process there um, and then once I kind of found it, it was just like really yeah in love with that process of, of printmaking awesome um so Beyond a Rising Sun is comprised of digital prints um could you talk a little bit about um the shift from using the um, presses to creating digital prints and what that has been like? Uh, yeah, it's definitely been a lot different, um, but kind of the same uh, in the way that the process that I often use for printmaking um, kind of did start still in some of the paintings um, throughout my whole uh, studio and BFA program used a lot of uh, some of the paintings or would use painting as kind of like a relaxation from not having to work on maybe some of the um, you know thesis work and whatnot but would take a lot of those textures and things from my paintings into um, some of my copper etchings and then kind of would take some of those things back into screen printing and kind of mixing and matching kind of like a collage per se um, of all these different elements through the different printmaking processes and so part of when I would design some of the screen prints, um, I would take like some of the scans and kind of do mock-ups in uh, Photoshop and kind of some of those other platforms. And sometimes I would just get the um, scans made into uh, transparencies that you use for screen printing. And sometimes I would just cut them up and do collages myself and kind of find where I wanted layers. Um, but it was kind of sometimes easier to not, for one, spend money as a college student 
um, cutting up these things and you're like, that's another dollar, it's another dollar. Um, and instead you could kind of take those scans, kind of cut them up, see where you like them, and then either just do some manual yourself, or you could kind of take those direct um, different layers that you've made from those scans and kind of get those individual layers printed for transparencies. Um, and so it was kind of like this digital collage process that started for my BFA thesis. And essentially what the show for Beyond the Rising Sun kind of encapsulated was really diving more into that digital part of the process. And um, if you were to take scans of your work, you know, you can get high quality digital um, copies made of those prints. So you're not always having to manual print off ones, um, but kind of taking like one step out of the equation and just being able to use just the digital platform to kind of go from start to finish, take some scans, take some self-made uh, textures, and then kind of just go wild into the kind of pattern making or collage style, um, but just in keeping it in the digital platform and doing like color mock-ups. So less mixing ink and some of those other fun processes, but kind of like seeing how they get to work out digitally and kind of really diving into that part of the, the process. So were all of the pieces in Beyond a Rising Sun, are they all created using that same method of um, scanning and then taking the time to mess around with like color and pattern digitally? Uh, yeah, so um, some of the, the patterns were even ones that I held on to um, back from my BFA thesis. Um, some have been some new textures that I've been kind of working with. And some of the ideas were things that I didn't feel fit maybe the BFA thesis at the time and had kind of like these like per se like sketchbook drawings in a digital way um, in Photoshop files and kind of went back to those as not really having a guaranteed studio space um, in like the last two, three years or so um, and kind of you know going back to the digital sketchbook and going okay like let's you know push this idea out a little bit or let's mess around with this um, and so it was kind of fun to maybe kind of explore some of those things that could become like their own own kind of idea together um, outside of the BFA when they didn't fit and just kind of really yeah dive into those things. Um, is there something about creating digital prints that you enjoy or prefer um, over using the printing press? Um, there is a little bit of the easiness of sometimes time constraints. Um, you know, when you have an idea, it is kind of like sketching it out on your sketchbook, but you can take, you know, that kind of base layer and you can just keep throwing Photoshop layers on or whatnot. Um, and you kind of just keep building and building and kind of like erasing away or, or deleting things easier on that same kind of like original page. Um, and sometimes like saving one document as the, the base layer and then kind of like saving as another. And then you can just kind of go wild and then maybe look back and go, okay, like how much has I changed from this? Or like, has it wildly changed from that original concept? And there's maybe something else that you can do. And when I was in the, the BFA, we did um, an artist talk with three of the other printmakers that I had um, for some of the grants that we got from the Whatcom Art Guild. And the focus of one of mine was that pretty much in printmaking, you have like everything is infinite content. Um, with printmaking, you, if you have your stencil or your, um, you know, your screen or your, your uh, copper plate, any color can be put down, any gradient, um, any paper that goes underneath it, you immediately have a new print. And especially in the digital way, um, there is, for a few of the pieces in the show, I probably had four or five other examples that were really similar, but maybe had a different layer shift, maybe, you know, orange on top of the blue, alternating or, you know, change the direction of one of the, the patterns of the hexagons or something and you know creating different flows or movements through the piece and it's it's really fun to have just literally like infinite content that like you know you change one thing and it's all of a sudden just enough different to be a different piece um and you can get carried away and a little lost in that sometimes and i know when i was working on the show there's definitely you know four or five hour periods where you'd be like 
okay, I still am going to go with like that first one, but like all these other iterations, you know, were, were fun to see where those, those boundaries could be pushed. And so there is this kind of like freedom, um, a little bit of restrictedness in the sense of like getting worried that you could get lost in like one piece and not like continuing to kind of develop other ideas um, as I was moving through the show. Um, but that like any, yeah, like I said, any color, any small change can just give you, uh, you know, unlimited possibilities to that next step. Um, and so you kind of do have that freedom to, to not feel like you're boxed in, maybe as if you only have like one painting canvas to work with um, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So what is the, the thing that you were looking for when you were creating those iterations of the pieces? What is um, the feature in the version of the print that you found that made you go, that one is going to be included in the show? Um, sometimes just even looking at thumbnails, seeing how those patterns like enlarge, um, you know, maybe you'd look at one intricate thing, but then as a miniature, you would see like a different movement. Um, the very first piece in the show on the website, um, serotonin in this economy, um, was definitely one of those ones where immediately like had zoomed in on maybe like three or four of the individual hexagon formations um, and was kind of liking this interplay and then kind of in the same or the previous note like backing out a little bit um, turning certain things or different groups together and then all of a sudden finding these movements through um, I've always enjoyed kind of not necessarily the illusion of messing with like perspective in in work or like a 3d aspect but have definitely enjoyed when your attention is is constantly trying to figure out like where things are going in a piece or discovering something new in it and kind of yeah like being able to like push things into like a smaller size um, and, and find different patterns in those and then maybe liking as they were in a miniature or enlarged um, you know finding one that I really liked that movement a lot more and would keep coming back to it so if I was going through like four or five previews you know, those two that I kept getting stuck on was like, like, I really like those ones and just kind of, you know, when you make something and you enjoy it, you can kind of like, you just kind of feel it. So just getting stuck on a few of those ones and being like, that's, that's the ones that I, I need to not settle with, but um, yeah, happy to move on and be able to just continue working on other stuff, knowing that you're building the catalog for the show. Right. Yeah. I definitely noticed that, um, I feel like you could view the show as a series of pairs. I don't know if that was intentional, but I found that just um, visually in the um, color scheme of some pairs and in the patterns that were chosen, um, I felt like switching between two of the prints that may look very similar um, and like, darting my eyes between the two, I found multiple patterns that I didn't notice the first time around. So that's fun. That's something that I enjoy about the show, especially being able to look at the show as a whole, the way it's laid out as sort of a, almost a Pinterest board is how I like to describe it. So seeing that like mosaic pattern as if they were tiles is striking. And then to zoom into each individual piece and notice those, um, additional patterns is especially fun. I feel like it's uh, it's enjoying um, the experience of just looking at the object, which is cool. I feel like that's a virtue of, of the show. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the title of, I think it's the first one in the lineup, which is the serotonin in this economy. And I wanted to talk to you briefly about the titles of the works and how you came up with those because they're so funny and I am just curious about uh, the process of titling them. Yeah um, I mean like I, I think humor and uh, just kind of being able to be not so serious at the same time to be um, taking care of business per se um, kind of like an essential factor uh, of of both I found, I think, through the BFA um, and being able to take yourself seriously, but 
be able to not like maybe overwhelm yourself um, with things and and not working in like a print studio uh, for like the last few years uh, has definitely missed some some parts of like that process and in, in regular um, kind of maybe like those jokes that you would share with like people as you, as you worked on things or kind of, of finding some of the humor in your your day-to-day -day life as you you know kind of just go through things and um uh, i guess for those some of them maybe dealt with uh having like some of like you know feeling depressed in like the year that we've gone through um maybe just personal in general like we said like dealing with anxiety and, and reading up or learning about some of these things um but also i think like pop culture and certain things can definitely have their place in, in any work and so some of the the pieces um there has been like a resurgence of things from 2012 and memes lately and and whatnot and i think the the whole vine like TikTok type thing was like one of the comparisons made um so i know like the like cap and hook would hate like the new vine or like would hate TikTok type of thing and and kind of like adding just like a, a little layer that maybe doesn't take things so seriously in some of the work um and then maybe for some of the other ones um you know a little bit of of some serious note like you know do we have time to be happy like in this economy and you know uh, a lacking of minimum wage areas or you know the the social injustice struggles that we go to and trying to find like kind of like a, a a grounding or a happiness for us and how art can kind of be some of those things to circle back around um and, and collect ourselves um both in a serious nature for advocating for things but also for you know being able to take things off our shoulders and, and breathe a little bit um and so yeah there's there's quite a variety and I've, I've always enjoyed like puns and other things like that um and have seemed to always work with people that are um can feed off each other and in both like a, a comical way and uh you know like serious like getting work done way and so some of those things have maybe kind of been from the last year in quarantine or before um and just kind of yeah just finding things that uh, I felt, I guess, as as well, a lot of the work in the BFA and the thesis um, definitely had more serious tones, whether it was from like reading like books or whatnot. Um, some things would be often taken, um, like Jim Morrison and some of his early poetry from the doors was uh, a big part of some of the year leading up to my BFA work and small snippets of like his poetry and, and certain things helped kind of inform that. Um, and I guess for like this, kind of show afterwards it was like let's be a little less serious with maybe some of those like underlying tones for it um and kind of just be able to breathe a little bit and, and, and laugh about some of the things as well yeah i appreciate that um i love to see a pop culture reference in artwork especially to social media like i i don't think that any um uh, mention or reference to social media in the work of art needs to be like critical of, or um, as much as much fun as that is. Um, it is nice to see something different that references the the life that we all live. Everybody uses TikTok, you know. Um, so I I really appreciate the the titles just as they were. Um, so I did also want to ask you about your inspirations for the show. I know that in your artist statement, you mentioned being heavily inspired by music from the late 60s, early 70s. Could you talk a little bit more about um, the specifics or like um, instances of inspiration that helped inform you with Beyond a Rising Sun? Yeah, um, I guess there's uh, a few artists in particular um, that I was kind of have always really enjoyed um and like kind of like led zeppelin or or pink floyd as like just kind of like bigger names but a lot of the other bands that kind of came through some of those movements um some of the like writers um that like went through heavy heavier lives per se maybe than some others uh like lou reed um warren zevon um and like quite a few other people that kind of had like a darker tone to their music as they were moving um, through different phases of their own lives or the health issues that they faced um, and, and kind of semi facing some health issues in this last year myself um, and trying to, you know, ensure 
that I'm going to continue on in a, in a good way um, for myself. And I was kind of just drawn between some of the parallels in today's um, kind of social atmosphere as we're going on then. Um, and while definitely not like an apparent part of the work, I would think um, there's definitely something to look back at the, the late 60s um, to early 70s and some of the social injustices that were going on then to some of the same things that we're still fighting for now and striving for. Um, and there are some modern contemporaries that um, I think kind of shared some of those things and was kind of with more of the free time in this last year, um, kind of really got to dig into certain people's discographies, um, really see where, you know, maybe what they were doing in their lives. Um, I know one interesting aspect per se of like Led Zeppelin um, was that like they would kind of do a retreat after some of the albums or shows and often to like, you know, this pretty much quarantined uh, themselves uh, out in like the mountains at like Bronyar and whatnot. And uh, it was just kind of like one of those similarities that I would look at as I was kind of looking to, to kind of have that free time to make work and, and similarities to that. But also the, the kind of change of there was like this kind of like folksy um, as like rock really wasn't becoming, you know, what it would become towards like the 70s to 80s um, and like certain of the heavier elements. But there was definitely like this like folk kind of like aspiration and kind of idealism that was um, just kind of, I don't know, these like very free minded in a sense, obviously, of the, those tones and it kind of definitely switched into the 70s of like a little more like music's always been about pattern but there is almost these like different structures I felt that would come with like prog rock and, and all these different elements that would kind of build up together um Jethro Tull is uh one of the other ones that first added flute into like a lot of the rock music and whatnot and so these kind of like different elements or like per se Pink Floyd like getting really like orchestral and and adding all these like you know soulful voices and different things in and, and really dealing with some of the same things of maybe life or death or um you know social struggles but in different ways um as they were moving like after things maybe got you know able ability to vote for more people and, and things like that um and so kind of some of these like how these patterns all mesh together uh, was kind of like part of the ways that i informed myself through the work, uh, just kind of emotion and pattern and like looking at those time changes as well as kind of like the color schemes, patterns as well. You mentioned um, tiles earlier. And um, I know one of the other things that I had looked up recently was um, very disconnected in a sense, but um, there is like a lot of uh, injustice going on um, by like Turkey and Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia and some of the struggles that Armenia has gone through for like decades uh, and some of the tile work and like artwork and fabric work from um, Armenia and other parts of the Middle East um, just the way that they kind of don't always use like imagery of like people figures animals as the main subjects of their work but oftentimes like tiles geometry um, was also a really interesting aspect and how those things interplay. So yeah, some of that like tile uh, appearance in like the artwork of the show definitely kind of is also rooted in some of those ways um, and to, to kind of like retie it back in together. Um, some of the modern, <laughs> modern contemporaries that I really enjoy um, are really heavily informed by like Middle Eastern music patterns um, some of the entrance uh, instruments of there and some of the music theory that is really only present in um, music from like the Middle East because of the instrument types and the notes that are available in some of their instruments. Um, and so like having some of those modern contemporaries as well, learn from some of those same areas and then just kind of like, I don't know, you could almost say looking at the, the wall with all the yarn on it, trying to connect thoughts um, to different places that just kind of all kind of centers into um, yeah, like the artwork of the show and kind of comes back to like all these different pieces of a puzzle kind of getting put together in a various way um, and then trying to build it into like a little more of a co cohesive theme. Mm. 
Um, have you listened to um, any like prog rock or folk uh, music from the 60s, 70s from the Middle East? Um, yeah, there is a few like guitarists and even um, female artists that um, was really surprising before maybe some of the, the governmental changes that occurred um, in like the 70s and 80s and whatnot. Um, and yeah, it's, there's just, it's like hard because some of it doesn't really get out all the time, but with the way we have like, you know, YouTube and, and Spotify and some of those other things where some of these really not known artists are finally able, you know, getting picked up by some random records and their kind of old discographies are coming back. Um, it's definitely interesting, even if you don't know the, the uh, language per se, um, it's still interesting to hear some of that soulful music or, excuse me, the way that, um, you know, they build up their, their kind of like wall of sound. Um, even like, uh, I have a few friends that are from the Philippines and Katina music and whatnot is really big over there and seeing how like they structure their music. And even if they're covering some like popular American rock songs from the seventies and whatnot, um, it's just really interesting to see how they covered uh, like Aerosmith or something like that. And, and even, yeah, you don't, maybe, you know, the song, but you don't know the, the lyrics um, in the language, but like you can kind of break across these bridges and whatnot. Um, and I, I just always kind of been fascinated by once again, like that music uh, patterns, the emotion that maybe you can't tell exactly what is going on, but you can, you can feed off that emotion in their voice and kind of the inflections of, of possibilities there. Yeah, totally. Um, I asked that because one of the, um, this is sort of a, uh, side note, but um, lately I've been very, very into listening to um, not just playlists, but like they're really long form um, videos of DJs playing old records from around the world, different time periods um, on YouTube. The channel is called My Analog Journal. I don't know if you listen to it, but um, I found a ton, like a whole slew of um, music from other countries from the 60s, 70s that I had never heard before, but is just really fulfilling a need for me lately. So I yeah. recommend it if you haven't listened already. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. It's always nice to have like something on in the background um, and that can like kind of pull you out of the process for a minute. And, and you know, when something changes a tempo or something that you like really catches on for a second and like paying attention to why um in that moment those things are, are like really pulling out of you yeah it's definitely something um it's really hard for me personally to like read and write with sound because i um attach to like the language um and it confuses me but um i really like listening to that channel when i'm doing some other task like uh something that requires like more logic or um if I'm cleaning or just hanging out, um, yeah, I recommend it. I feel like I was, um, when I was receiving the work for Beyond a Rising Sun, I felt as though um, the same sort of mood that is captured by some of my favorite videos on that channel is captured in the pieces or even in the show as a whole. Um, and I think it's probably because of, of those inspirations that you just described. Um, I did have another question. Um, oh, right. So as you were um, describing um, some of the various ways that um, music from that period, 60s, 70s, um, and even from other countries has informed the works of Beyond the Rising Sun, um, I'm wondering if you feel as though um, through the process of like sitting with those concepts through meditating on um, music from the period and the the sort of cultural context that um, those uh, bits of music were created if that has helped you or if you see potential for it being able to help um, a contemporary individual in um, processing the things that we're currently going through yeah i 
I think like definitely taking maybe sometimes a break from definitely news cycles, social media is definitely an important way. Um, but also maybe like learning and finding out more context is always good um, to say, this is the way we've done something and that's how it is, I think is, is can be damaging and, and then they're extending why like change could be necessary um, and, and beneficial for so many reasons. Um, and, and sometimes getting distracted with the music, um, like learning more about, you know, a particular background or, or why those things maybe were, were used or instruments or what the inspiration was when those people were writing stuff and kind of making those connections. Um, so like myself, uh, I think it's definitely a valuable experience to just continue learning constantly. Um, and that's why while nothing might have came full force through but learning about like tile work or, or certain geometries and kind of relearning some of those different things um, definitely helped kind of maybe take a pause and a break while making the show and, and give like a breather or a reminder to like oh, let's step away and, and make some food real quick while listening to this one specific part or or turning on like a different youtube video to explain more about like you know or like a mini documentary to, to learn more about certain things and, and then kind of jump back into a different thing um yeah i just think some of those things can just be really beneficial while taking a break sometimes from some of the doom and gloom of the news that it can bring um being able to to maybe understand like why you're feeling those ways or how things got to a way that they are um and why those things are going on is, is also important yeah um so i am the more that i do these q a's and i speak with other creatives um in our podcast psa with asp i um am feeling myself and i'm anticipating that others might be feeling um some fatigue from talking about the pandemic but i do want to ask about your experience um working on this body of work during the pandemic if if you don't mind <laughs> Yeah, um, so I was actually working for a company that did did printmaking and whatnot um, before the pandemic and, and somewhat during the pandemic. Um, and uh, eventually, um, just with the way things were going, had moved on from that and uh, essentially was definitely kind of looking to fill back in my time. Didn't realize maybe how much over the year uh, and a half or so that I had been um, doing that, constantly making work for other people, um, which was was fun, but it wasn't necessarily like directly related to the the printmaking that I had done in, in school. Uh, and feeling with any passion, hobby or whatnot, the the after you work a full day of, of work or you're you're busy with whatnot, like trying to come back to that sometimes can be really difficult. So it kind of was rewarding. I think I definitely procrastinated a lot in the early months of being like, oh, I have free time. I could do this and then being like, or I could take a walk outside and, and, and whatnot and try to enjoy that summer weather or whatever um, last year. And uh, kind of did take a little bit to start getting back into it. Um, I, along with your opportunity um, for the shows that popped up and, and whatnot, through the BU gallery, there's been kind of as people shifted their understanding of maybe how long we were gonna be in this situation and that maybe galleries weren't gonna open in the same ways and whatnot, that I did start to see in like November timeline or so, a lot more of these like opportunities that were gonna be virtual exhibits or shared print work where sometimes they were asking for physical pieces. Sometimes it was just like, digital catalogs, but they were trying to reach out these other creatives and, and find you know people that maybe did or didn't have time to get to one area or another, um, but we're still looking to have that art and that kind of uh, ability to just keep creating and not halt that just because we had to be on lockdown. Um, so that kind of did push the, the digital aspect as in like, okay, if we don't have areas where we can go to studios or something else or the availability to get some of these materials and whatnot is now locked or the art shops are 
limited and closed or shipments, you know, wherever they're coming from Europe and, and whatnot, aren't really coming in regularly. Like, what are you going to do? And so that kind of helped spur the, the digital aspect a little bit more, but also some of these print exchanges in New York and a few other ones when they popped up was, was definitely like, you know, like, what am I doing with my time? And, you know, might as well just kind of refine some piece of myself that maybe hasn't been the same since, since school and kind of looking back at some of those things, having the time to reflect. Um, and while just being able to sit on the couch with my cat was great some of the time, um, getting back active and, and working on things has also been um, pretty helpful with its own stresses at times, but definitely, I think, valuable to kind of not forget that those things can be really beneficial those processes, like I think we talked about maybe the first question um, in, in the session so far that, yeah, the, those processes and whether or not I realized that back then were really good for anxiety and, and getting our ideas out um, and, and not necessarily, whether it's art related or, or other emotions, like having to bottle stuff up sometimes and be able to kind of outwardly express those things into you know an art piece and that energy and kind of um almost like physically like shaking your arms or jumping jacks or something like getting that energy out um getting it out on like a canvas whether it's digital or, or, or physical and um yeah it's it's definitely been difficult as a creator and i'm sure like as a director of the gallery like having to find struggles of like oh when are we going to get people back when are we going to do these things and like always you know these unknown deadlines that keep moving back and, and back um and so it's kind of the same thing as like i was looking for opportunities to expand in the last year into studio spaces and whatnot and kind of expand my personal work and getting that kind of rug pulled away but going like oh it's it's not completely over it's not uh impossible that there's definitely ways to continue working and, and trying to thrive just in a different way that you might have not realized at first yeah, I, um, you know, a part of what has been the experience of, of being in a pandemic is like, for a while, I feel like a lot of people have suddenly had a lot more time, um, but they didn't have, that didn't also come with uh, the resources or the spaces or the connections or the opportunities to do things that we may have wanted to do um, had we been given that free time under different circumstances. So that's yeah. been a struggle. And then um, I, I feel like my, um, personally, my relationship towards work or my opinion of my work ethic and how hard I should be working has definitely shifted during the pandemic. And I um, am currently experiencing like um, a very slow return of motivation <laughs> to get back into work. Um, but it does feel good to, to return to a project. Um, and at the same time, I feel like myself and many others have probably um, really needed the break that, that was allowed, no matter how brief or sporadic or, um, you know, random they have been. I think that the, the breaks have been nice. Um, definitely feels like I can appreciate what I do a little bit more. Um, and it sounds like that might be similar to what you were feeling. Yeah, for sure. I mean, was it was it a struggle to to deal with that kind of like immediately like pull back of like the educational like in person when especially like being on campus, everything is so interactive and you kind of depend on those social interactions. And then like, yeah, how was it to all of a sudden like try to formulate a new plan for this unknown amount of time. Yeah. Um, you know, I was um, in an art history course at the time that this happened. We were working on research papers. Um, so it was definitely uh, weird to um, go from the classroom, lecture room, or not lecture room, but the discussion based um, class where. Um, most of what you're gaining out of that experience is the conversations that you have with other people that you, it's really, really hard to have over Zoom. <laughs> um, it's been getting easier, but it is difficult. Um, but from what I've heard, it's been 
especially hard on the um, studio art students. Um, I know that they have the opportunity to go on campus for um, quite a few of their classes, which is great, um, but they aren't allowed that um, familiarity with being able to um, connect as much with uh, their fellow artists or their cohort members or whatever it is. So um, I think that that experience has probably been more difficult than what I've had. And I feel like at this point I've adapted. Um, and now I'm like, I kind of like it. I like not being able, I like not having to um, prepare to go to campus like two hours before I have to be there. That's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Like thinking back about that, like I'm sure that's something I know myself um, as someone that used to like bike up to campus or rely on the buses or something. Or if it was raining, you know, making that choice of like, do I really bike home in the rain or is there some other part of the printing or yeah, yeah like some, should I read the rest of this, you know, chapter for one of the uh, like mm -hmm. art history classes or something and, and really making that debate. And I'm sure that like within this last year, there's definitely been some thankful moments of being able to be like, I can just turn on a button and be right at, you know, class. Yeah. And yet sometimes I've still been late. So I, it doesn't, it hasn't solved every problem, but um, yeah, I think there's pros and cons. I also feel like because I'm uh, finally at my last year, my course load has just been super light. So um, I think that that's been an advantage that I've experienced that um, I feel like getting to class is a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been weird. It continues to be weird, I, and I don't doubt that it will continue to be weird for a long time. Yeah, I mean, especially for I've known a few of the um, students that are kind of like printmaking studios still, um, and talking with them throughout this year. Well, it's definitely like yeah, you can't necessarily like see maybe the layers of the artwork and stuff, um, and maybe they're almost reduced to some of this like yeah, some of the the art history or having to like look through a different lens at some of the work um and i know at least with like some of the digital work with like the prints in the show like being able to zoom in or out kind of still sometimes gives you a little bit of that like examination of stuff but i wouldn't be able to imagine like only getting like a two-hour block once a week or something to be able to go up to the studios and, and stuff like that so hearing some of their struggles is definitely made me appreciate what I had when I was there um, in the time time period, but also, um, you know, like you said, appreciate some of the breaks too and, and the breaks that have been provided. Um, yeah, and I think one of the most frustrating things is not being able to interact with work in person. Um, and I think that that's um, a great advantage to having well, first of all, there's several great advantages to having a virtual show um, as an option, <laughs> but as the default, it's a little bit more frustrating. Um, but it's it's been great to see um, digital work. I believe yours is only the second show we've had um, since the pandemic started that's entirely comprised of digital work that was from its inception made digitally to be viewed, viewed, to be viewed um, through a screen. And it's been um, great to put that to use in a digital space. Um, but then th the drawback from having a, a default digital um, viewing space is that um, with the current BFA, um, our show with them a few months ago, um, Inside Out is very cool. The artwork is very cool. I really wish that I um, could have done that in person. I was really excited to um, curate a show around the, the virtual, or excuse me, the view gallery, that physical gallery. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that they were excited to do the same. So there's a lot that's been lost in, in having to do things virtually. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, the current VFA's spring show in the Western Gallery because I believe that that will be accessible to um, students and staff, faculty. I'm not sure if alumni can come, but yeah. um, they will at least be able to install their work and then document it for viewing later. Whereas like 
some of the images of the work that you can see in um, our sh in um, Inside Out is yeah. uh, not it. installed ideally according to the creator. So yeah, yeah. And I, I remember so in um, when I was graduating, the VU was is is it the multicultural student center or whatever? It was, yeah, it was becoming. Um, the VU itself is the physical layout um, similar to what it was then, or did it? How did it change um, in like the last two years when they kind of like finished up? Because I know they wanted to end it at one point and move it to like just like a hallway space, and it almost seems scary with the pandemic that like they could argue that oh well like it could just be digital like why do you need the physical space? But like I think you just highlighted there's an importance to curating and having this way that you would go through the gallery and the mm -hmm. art show. So I was wondering, yeah, what the physical layout um, of that is and, and how those things um, um, began. Yeah, so I'm sure you can remember there was a time when the Viking Union Gallery was closed um, because of the MCC being um, constructed. So um, I actually don't remember ever being in the physical space of the gallery before I um, took over this position. So um, I think I have a vague memory of when they had the poster sale in there. Yeah, they would do that every but, day. But um, I don't think I ever saw um, an exhibition in there until I, until I was the director. So um, from what I know, they added a column. Uh, they're like diagonal from each other. And then in the original column, they sort of um, gave it some more support. So it's even wider. There's this weird um, space between the stairs and the column where we've put the um, what would be the attendance desk. Yeah. And that's not really a space for art. So it's kind of a wasted space um, in that it's really not ideal for hanging something on that wall. And then, um, yeah, to my knowledge, the, the ramp has been there. And I think that's it. Um, yeah. The floor is a different color underneath the new column, but that's okay um yeah it's just one one of the things that i am very much looking forward to in the future is going to exhibitions in person um experiencing the way that someone has um designed the space with the work in mind i'm very excited to have an experience like that soon yeah i know there's been for some of the local galleries like appointment only or you know mm -hmm. those like kind of difficult times and I, I've seen that you know on, on social media from other artists like in Seattle or, or a few of the printmakers I follow in Berlin like you know the how different restrictions um, for COVID and for lockdowns have affected those like in-person gatherings per se or what those businesses are classified as how they can continue um, and like yeah even the school it's like for for those BFA people to have their show to be able to hang something as you would want it um you know for that display so that you get you know that that experience that the artist is, is trying to employ for the the viewer uh, is definitely important so um well like, yeah it's, it's nice to have these digital aspects um or for me who had kind of moved into a digital thing being like oh this is nice i don't have to stress someone out coming in that's not vaccinated or something and having to work with another person that they you know haven't been around in their bubble or something to install a piece um, or whatnot and being able to just hand over per se these digital copies um, but knowing that there is something that's missed when you don't get to have those those physical uh, layouts and get those like interactions as you move through a cohort of 12 people or a different group show or whatnot yeah and it's, I mean um, you also can't interact with other people visiting the space, at least with the with the virtual view gallery, there's no, I don't even know how many people are viewing the, the space because there's no way to tell. Yeah. Um, and if there are people viewing the space at the same time, they can't really interact with each other. Um, we have attempted to use um, a platform called Gather Town for people to um, like log in, use a code to get into the right room, and then you can, it's almost like Discord where you can yeah. speak directly to people who are also in that room and you get a little avatar that moves around the room. Oh, um, 
And so luckily with ASP, we've been able to create a whole recreation of like spaces there. So we've had movies there, we've had um, um, not speed dating, but like a dating event that we did for um, something called Lonely Hearts Club for Valentine's Day, which yeah. was cool. I remember seeing that um, on the, the Instagram. Yeah, so that's been cool. And th there was um, an idea to recreate the shows in their own Gallertown space. And it's just something that um, I felt like would be easiest if we like put a screen in Gallertown and put like a link so that your little avatar could like look at what is essentially the same thing as on your computer screen. Yeah. And then other people in the same room could talk to each other. That's just something that we haven't gotten around to doing. Um, I don't know at this point if that's worth doing, but um, yeah, utilizing something like Discord has been helpful too because there's people want to interact with each other and talk about whatever it is, whatever it is they want to talk about. They want to, if they want to go to one of our movie screenings, then they can go and chat with um, someone who's miles away in their own apartment watching the same movie about that movie. And that's been cool. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I was like, even like the, something as like Animal Crossing, like I know those yeah. nights or whatever. Um, and that being able to bring people together because Western's so connected to not just here, but there's people in Seattle that, mm -hmm. you know, aren't coming back up or whatnot. Um, but that you can feel like you're just one dorm over or something like that. Um, and I think that being able to utilize those platforms to connect um, for the students is, is really valuable. Yeah, it's been cool. I didn't even, it's my first time using Discord. I didn't know that Gather Town was until recently, but that's great. It's something that we um, we're trying to push on the other AS offices, like use this tool, it's very cool. Um, but there really is no substitute um, for the physical gallery space. Um, but I will say that the one thing that I think is really awesome about virtual galleries in general, and something that I think um, institutions that continue to use, um, which is a virtual gallery, is because um, they're just more accessible. They're more accessible for people who um, maybe lack the means to visit a gallery in person. So that's something that I really appreciate about the virtual spaces. And I think they can become even more accessible um, to differently abled folks um, so that they're easily navigable um, and that you can recreate as much of the experience or the education or the narrative that you want people to experience as possible. So um, uh, yeah, maybe we'll see more um, a continued utilization of virtual gallery spaces um, in the future, you know, in the next five, 10 years, I, I would hope to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I feel like a lot of times too, you just get maybe like shots of like the open spaces mm -hmm. and, and maybe not as like a catalog way as, as has to be like for this last year or um, for like the, the last BFA show and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Like one of the best things about the art walks in town or you know just being able to go to some of the the different shows because i know that bu has like constantly had like other established artists from all over um you know have their pieces come through and and, and whatnot and it's sometimes being able to meet them or, or have those uh inner exchanges and, and just being able to talk to people or even teachers that maybe like i didn't have myself um i know we had like alan de souza from UC Berkeley come up in 2018, I think. Um, and we had like two print classes that were working on things, one like early printmaking and one of the more like advanced printmaking um, and got to like collab on a project that they was also collabing with Alan D'Souza from UC Berkeley about um, kind of like diaspora and change and um, you know immigration and um, all sorts of things. And then also had that tied in with like some of the art history teachers that maybe I had never met and being able to just kind of talk with them as like I've never been had the privilege of taking your class but like obviously you know like you're well versed in some of this and, and just kind of being able to explore those things I know is definitely something that is missed but then you can also see those opportunities um, such as some of my family that has moved maybe from Seattle or Portland area and live in Colorado California New York um, and whatnot and have been like reaching back out to me um, 
sometimes to share recipes in the pandemic, but also to like, oh my gosh, like you got a show going on or something like that. And obviously they're, they're not traveling up in the same ways that anyone used to, um, but, you know, being able to reach out to some of those um, friends and family that whether they live, you know, just a, a city over or miles and miles states away, I think that aspect of them being able to not just being like, oh, my show, um, but like the fact that like anyone can come in and view those spaces and kind of put themselves in that virtual aspect um, is a really valuable thing. And I know like kind of um, ever since like getting the feedback that the show was going to be in April um, a few months ago, um, or even before like at the application kind of status and, and following some of the BFAs from this year, um, seeing what was going on um, with the Viking Gallery has definitely been a cool way to still with those lack of art walks with those galleries shut down and, and limited things um, has kind of just been a nice like reflection and like reminder as well that like art art isn't really taking a break um, or locking itself down or, or shutting down um, and that like you know just like a tree growing in concrete or something like everything's finding a way to kind of keep moving forward um whether we're using like new platforms we've never used ever um or that weren't even really around until this happened uh but has yeah found the, the value in those things and still being able to connect to people yeah um i appreciate that you've been enjoying what's going on in the U gallery it is like i said it's really hard to gauge um the engagement level um i have what's been great about using something like discord is that um younger um underclassmen are finding out about the view gallery like people who maybe just moved to bellingham who are freshmen at western who haven't been able to explore the campus are now able to through social media sites that they're probably already using um experience everything that western has going on and um hopefully everything else that that bellingham has going on so um it's awesome to hear that uh it's been great for you. Um, so I have one last question for you. Yeah. Um, and that is, um, what is something that you are looking forward to, whether that be your upcoming project, or if you're going to continue this project or something unrelated? Um, I'm thinking like the next few months down the line, like, where are you headed? Um, kind of excited to really break maybe into some of those personal works again um definitely took like a year off um after graduation to kind of just like breathe um i feel like you almost forget to take care of yourself sometimes when you're um in school and you know you have these deadlines or whatnot or you're eating not eating as good food or, or whatever and so getting back into kind of some of those personal mental health things cooking and whatnot um exploring new recipes is always exciting but in the same way, exploring new art mediums, new avenues that um, I didn't know were around different print exchanges and um, different grants per se, and, and kind of getting back into pursuing some of those things um, that like we talked about is like kind of like exiting um, studio classes or exiting how to set up your art practice kind of classes. Um, and whether that's, you know, setting up a digital shop for yourself, um, being inspired by a lot of the people that graduated before me or after me um, and seeing, you know, following their social medias and seeing, you know, how they've like mapped out things for themselves. And like you said, kind of like enjoying that break that was happened, the lockdown and, and all this stuff, um, simply for maybe being able to reorganize myself, have the time to look through old prints, reorganize those, whether they're to sell or whether they're to create new artwork um, whether to ship for, you know, different, um, print exchanges, um, that are still kind of going on and, um, kind of just looking forward to getting back more into the art process itself, whether it's digital or physical, um, and just kind of looking into some of those opportunities that I know are talked about, like commissions, grants and whatnot, um, but maybe really pursuing those a lot more. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you were able to catch, um, I think it was my first um, PSA with ASP episode. You can watch a video or it's now a podcast. You can listen to it. But in my first episode, I was able to speak with um, Jessica Gavronsky, who's the founder of Seattle Art Post. And yeah. um, in that conversation, 
um, she enlightened me with like the sheer number of resources that are available to artists looking for um, opportunities, whether that be um, grants or commissions or um, looking to gain some new skills during the pandemic. So um, there's a, a space, I think, at least on um, our YouTube, probably in the description of that video, there's lots of, um, there's at least a handful of resources there for you if you or if you're not already familiar with those. Um, yeah, but I definitely have to bookmark that. Yeah, there's, um, and I mean, you can also reach out to Seattle Art Post. I think that's one of the my favorite organizations that I found during the pandemics. Um, you know, something regional that's still, I mean, they're still working on getting um, lesser known artists, not only some spotlight, but um, some like revenue, some opportunities, some recognition for their work that they're still making. Um, so it's great to not only talk to you, someone who's been working despite these conditions and um, excited to see what other cool stuff you're working on. So yeah, I think that's it. I think that's all the, the questions I had. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure to have the conversation with you and to have the opportunity to display and be a part of the continually developing process that you guys have at the VU Gallery. Awesome. Yeah, we've loved having you. Um, okay, like I said, um, this is recorded. I'm going to upload it to YouTube, and then once that's done, I'll add it to your exhibition. So, thank you. It'll be it'll be there forever, <laughs> <laughs> assuming my successor doesn't take it down. So, For sure. um, awesome. And I will let you know when this is uploaded. All right. Thank you so much, Nate. Yeah. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.